I'm going to cover the, uh, the circular law today, which you can think of as the um, uh, non Hermitian analog of the semicircle law. So, of course, uh, we've seen the semicircle law many times already. So, just to remind you okay, that uh, if you take um, a vector matrix okay, n by n, okay. so it's symmetric. Um, commission, okay, and uh, let's, let's assume that the upper triangular entries are, let's say, IID, means zero variance one. Um, okay, so because I've made variance one, I have to, I have to normalize it now. So you have to, you divide by, by square root of n to um, um, to make the operator norm bounded, um, and then you can you can uh, define what's called the, the empirical spectral distribution. Um, uh, I'm sorry, mu of, of this measure. So what you do is that you take all the eigenvalues. Okay, so you, you look at the n eigenvalues. You look at the, um, you put a Dirac mass at each one of these eigenvalues. And then you, uh, you take the average. So you get this, this um, probability, probability measure. Um, in the semi-circuit case, it's on the real line. So you have all these, these eigenvalues. So you, you have this, uh, this, this Dirac mass, um, and the semicircle law says that, uh, um, yeah, so the, the vacant semicircle law says that as n goes infinity, um, these measures uh, converge to uh, the semicircle measure, which is uh, square root of 4 minus x squared uh, positive part, uh, and then divide by a constant, which I, I, I Maybe pi, I forget exactly what it was. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it converges to, to, to the semicircle law um, in distribution. Um, so uh, um, yeah, so, so the, the convergence, well, first of all, there's, 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 this is random. So you have to, you have to specify uh, either convergence and probability, or, or more surely. Um, it turns out uh, that, uh, that actually both are true, at least maybe if, if there's some moment conditions uh, on, on, on the measure. Um, and the convergence here, uh, the, the way in which this, this the discrete measure converges to the, the semicircle law, um, you can either make it convergence in distribution. So one way to say this is that if you, if you just measure um, this measure on, on some interval, you, you, which is basically counting how many eigenvalues there are in this interval, you, sh you should converge to Um, the corresponding area of the semicircle law, which is just the integral of its density, um, or equivalently, um, another way of, 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 of describing this convergence is, uh, is uh, you, you, cannot, you can say that this convergence is in the vague topology, which means that for all test functions, um, that if you integrate this measure against your test function, then uh, you'll converge to the integral of the same test function against uh, the semicircle law. Okay, so rather than take a, a histogram, you can, you can take some, some test function, um, some, some nice compactly supported uh, continuous function, and you can ask for convergence of, of all these statistics. And that is vague convergence. Um, these, these are equivalent uh, basically because the limit measure is continuous, so you can, you can, you can approximate um, this sharp cutoff of, uh, basically you can approximate an indicator function uh, above and below by continuous functions, and, and because the limit measure is continuous, so you can show these things are equivalent. Anyway, they, these, are, these are analytic technicalities. I don't really want to draw too much on these. But okay, so, so this, this is the semicircle law, which you've already seen um, many, many times. Okay, so the circular law is um, similar, but now uh, M, the matrix is an IID matrix, so not Hermitian. Um, so the entries are, let's say, all independent. Um, again, but still, again, means zero variance one. Um, you can relax the condition of being independent of IID quite substantially, but uh, for simplicity, we're just going to talk about the IID case. Um, okay, so once again, you, you have eigenvalues. 
Um, but now, because you're Hermitian, uh, non-Hermitian, so in, in the um, Wigner case, the, the eigenvalues are real. Um, now they're just complex. Um, oh, and in the, uh, the real case, they come in order. Right? The rule line is ordered, so you can talk about the, the smallest eigenvalues, second smallest, third smallest. Um, in, in the complex case, um, they don't come in any order. So this is just an unordered set. Um, but you can still form the empirical spectral distribution. Um, okay, so the eigenvalues, uh, sorry, eigenvalues of the normalized matrix. So remember, in the first lecture, we saw that this matrix has operator norm about root n. So to normalize it to have about to be a bounded norm, um, and hence bounded eigenvalues, you should divide by root n. That's the right scaling. Um, so once again, you can again form the, the exactly the same empirical spectral measure. Okay, and so this is now a discrete measure from the complex plane. Okay, um, and then the um, the circular law says that again, as n goes to infinity, uh, both in probability and almost in the almost sure sense, um, these empirical measures converge again in, in the vague sense to a limit, and the limit is now the circular uh, the uh, the circular measure, which is uh, a normalization one of a pi times the indicator function of the complex unit disk, I guess, times the big measure on the um, um, on the on the disk. So, so if you take the um, these eigenvalues and you um, you and get bigger and bigger, what will happen is that they will fill out eventually the unit disk um, uniformly with, with density one over pi. Okay, pi of course is the area of the unit disk. Um, so you get no eigenvalues outside the disk, or, or very few. Um, actually, it turns out you, you get basically none. Um, and all the eigenvalues are um, clustered inside the disk, but furthermore, they do so uniformly. There's, there's just as many eigenvalues over here as over here or as over here. Okay? And again, this convergence is in the vague sense. Um, you can either draw a rectangle and ask how many eigenvalues are in a rectangle, and it will be proportional to, to, um, to how much it is um, up to the, this, the, 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 the mass that the circular law gives to the same rectangle, um, or you can take a test function. Before and again, it's equivalent because this is a continuous measure. Okay, um, so this is the circle law. Uh, so it took many decades to prove this law. Um, so the Wigner law, uh, I don't have the data when it was proven. I think 50s or 60s. Uh, sorry, I, don't, I didn't record exactly when it was done. Uh, well, I, I guess um, uh, well that was also several papers uh, because there's, there's various. Uh, Hypotheses on the measure that, you, that uh, on the on the on the um, individual entries that you can start relaxing, but it was all done uh, in the six, at, at most by the sixties. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this, the circular law. Um, so in the case of Gaussian matrices, so th there's there's two Gaussian ensembles that are of interest here. There's the um, the, um, so yeah. So when, when I say variance one, uh, what I mean is is that the expectation. So these are complex numbers, and the expectation of the complex number squared is one. That's, that's what, what I mean by variance one. And of course, mean zero is mean zero. So there are two. Um, so there are several special ensembles that we care about. Um, so I focus mostly on the Bernoulli ensemble, where the integers are plus minus one. That's the most combinatorially interesting ensemble. Um, but the most sort of exactly solvable, from the point of view of, of, of explicit uh, uh, um, algebraic computations, the, the most um, explicit models are the Gaussian models. So there's, there's the real Gaussian matrices, where the, the Cs are real Gaussian of mean zero variance one, and then there's also the complex Gaussian, where the mean zero and variance one. Um, so they've both been studied. Um, so I, I think Meta was the first to analyze the complex Gaussian, which, which has the, the simplest um, um, distribution of the eigenvalues. In that case, the, the, the distribution is given by a nice little uh, log gas, or, um, uh, and, uh, and it's determinantal, and, and uh, there's lots and lots of formulas. Um, so that's the easiest case, and, and there you can verify pretty much by direct computation um, the circular law in that case. Um, and then I think Edelman uh, computed uh, the same thing for the real Gaussian. Uh, there the law is already more complicated. The, 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 uh, if you look at the correlation functions of the real Gaussian, it's no longer determinantal. Some, some Fafians appear. Uh, it's a bit messier, but it's still computable. Um, and then uh, Gurkel um, tackled the general case, um, although his, his first few arguments had a few gaps in them. Uh, but the general strategy was sound. 
um, and then later papers of, of many authors, including Gerkel, uh, um, um, well, made, made the arguments rigorous and, um, and covered more and more ranges of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, of random variables until now we can actually handle all uh, random variables mean zero variance one. Okay. Um, that was done about 10 years ago by, uh, or so, no, less than 10 years by, by Van Voon myself. 2009, maybe. Um, okay. So, um, all right. So that's the law. Now, um, okay, so there's, 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 there's several, okay, so there's, there's several questions here. All right. So, so, okay, first of all, how do you prove this? Okay. Uh, secondly, why the circular law? Okay. Okay, well, so first of all, actually, maybe um, the circular law is actually a slight misnomer. Um, it should really be called the disk law. Um, so the, the arguments are not, are not concentrating on the unit circle, they're concentrating in the unit disk. Um, I think the reason that they call it the circular law is because the Wigner law was already called the semicircle law. And, so, and there's also a quarter circle law, which I talked about before. And so I guess they wanted to keep the name somewhat similar. But it should be called the disk law. But anyway, that's, that's not the question. But okay, the, the question is why, um, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, why is it compared to the uniform measure on the, on the, on the, on the circle and not some other measure? You know, there's, there's so many other possible measures that you can think of here. Um, and the third question is, that why is it universal? Okay, so, you know, so Bernoulli, Gaussian, Ed, all, um, all the different uh, random matrix ensembles with different mean invariance, so with the same mean invariance but different distributions, they all converge in the limit to the same, um, the same answer. Now, this is, of course, this is universality. This happens all over the place in probability and certainly in, uh, in mathematics theory. So it's a familiar phenomenon, um, but what's the source? Where does it come from? Okay, um, so I'll try to answer some of the, these questions. Um, yeah, so okay, I, I can certainly answer question one, how do how, how, how we prove these things? Um, we have a pretty good understanding of why things are universal. Um, I still don't have a really good satisfying explanation of why particularly we get the circular law. Um, I mean, if you buy that it's universal, um, then um, you know, once you know the things is universal, if you want to check the circular law, you only need to check it for one ensemble. So like, if, 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 you, if you have some argument that says that, that Gaussian matrices have obeyed the circular law, and you know that, that the limiting law is independent of, of the distribution, that it's universal, then that will tell you that, every, um, uh, that the circular law holds in general. So universality sort of partly addresses this question in the sense that you only need to check one ensemble. Um, but even checking you know, the complex Gaussian case, which is the simplest case, um, to, to, to reach the circle law at the end, you still have to do like a page of computation. Um, I mean, which is not bad in the grand scheme of things, but still it's, it's uh, uh, yeah. I mean, well, I, I will try to address parts of this question as, 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 as time goes by. Okay, so how do we, how do we prove limit laws for, for spectral measures? Okay. So the, the empirical spectral measure by itself directly is not an easy object to address, but there's various um, things related to the spectral measure that, that you can address. Okay, so um, okay, so um, there are various methods to, uh, to understand spectral measures based on understanding certain transforms of this, uh, of this measure. So um, the most popular and original method is the moment, me moment method. And uh, what you do is that in instead of dealing with the measure directly, you deal with moments. Okay, you integrate your measure against uh, a polynomial, z to the k, um, and these are numbers. Um, and the, the point in dealing with these moments is that these numbers have a very, you know, um, have a very simple interpretation in terms of the original matrix. This is just the trace of uh, one of root n of uh, m n to the k. Okay. Uh, just from the spectral theorem. Okay. So you see, the thing is, the, the, the measure is difficult, okay? but, but the matrix is, is easy. Okay? The matrix, all the entries are IID. Right? It, 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 it's hard to think of it, anything much simpler than that in, in probability uh, than a bunch of, of IID random variables. Now, this is some polynomial of degree k in, the, um, in those random variables. It, it's somewhat less uh, uh, easy, but still, this is something which, at least for small k, this is something that we understand pretty well. Okay. And we have all these moment convergence theorems. You know, so, so, um, if you know that, that, that these moments converge, okay, so, so, so under certain conditions, okay, if you can prove that, that, the, um, uh, that these moments converge to what they should converge to, which is, which is uh, the moments of the corresponding limit law, 
Um, there are various moment convergence theorems that say that, that if you know that this is true for every k, then hopefully you can, you can deduce that the, that the measures actually converge. Okay. Um, now, uh, in practice, there's, uh, of course, everything's random, so you, you, have, to, you have to quantify uh, what this... What, so I, I haven't specified what kind of convergence uh, uh, you need here. Uh, you may need convergence in the almost sure sense or in probability or whatever, uh, and then that would impact what kind of co uh, convergence you get over here. Uh, let me ignore these issues. These are sort of um, real analysis sort of issues which are, which are not the most difficult aspect of, of this theory. So let me be vague. Oh, vague is ready. Okay, let me be... Uh, let me be... Uh, uh, not so precise as to what convergence means here. Okay. Um, all right. So, so that's the, that's the that's the, the moment method, roughly speaking. Um, then, uh, as we've seen, uh, particularly in uh, in Erdős's lectures, um, uh, we have the, the Stokes transform method. Okay, which is based on a slightly different um, statistic. Um, okay, uh, okay, maybe let's do W minus Z. Okay, so you take your measure and you integrate not against a polynomial, but against a 1 over uh, a linear function, 1 over uh, um, uh, W minus Z. Okay, um, so th this is a quantity which is also relatively, is, is not as easy to understand as, as, as this quantity here, but this also has a nice interpretation in terms of the matrix. Uh, this is just a trace. Um, actually, there's a sort of normalization. There's one of it in this trace. Normalized trace of um, normalized matrix minus Z times the identity matrix inverse. Okay, so it's just the trace of the Green's function, a trace of the resolvent. Okay, um, and this is something that we do have. It, it's not as easy to understand as, as, as these quantities here. This is no longer a polynomial in, um, in the entries, uh, but we have techniques um, to, to, to understand this quantity here. Okay, and again, there are um, um, convergence theorems that say that if, if these Stokes transforms converge in an appropriate sense to the Stokes transform of a limit measure, and maybe you need some other conditions on these on these measures, then hopefully you can deduce that these measures converge in an appropriate sense to to the limit. Okay, so there are various uh, sort of um, uh, analysis theorems that do that. Okay, now, so these are the, sort of the two major methods that we've seen already in other lectures, um, and they don't work very well for uh, this non-homogeneous problem. Um, and so there's a third method, so I'll explain why they don't work in just a little bit, but um, let me just finish this table. Yeah, so, so there's, there's a third method, which uh, you might call the, the logarithmic potential method. which works not with moments and not with the Stokes transform, but what you do is that you, you integrate your measure against a log function centered at some point z. Uh, let's actually make a W here. Okay, so you integrate against the, um, the logarithm of the absolute value. Um, okay, so um, the reason why this is good is because this also has a nice linear algebra interpretation. Uh, this turns out, uh, if you just use the spectral theorem, um, so, so uh, this is just, uh, okay, so explicitly it's 1 over n times log of the eigenvalues of this matrix minus z. Okay. That's just by definition of the measure, uh, eigenvalues of this normalized matrix. Um, and then the thing about log is, is that sum of log is log of a product. Uh, so you have the product of these eigenvalues, but the product of the eigenvalues is the determinant. So this is the same thing as one over n times log of the, of the absolute value of the determinant of uh, normalized matrix minus ci. Okay. So um, okay. So again, this this is this is not as easy to understand as the moments or uh, as uh, or the, the Green's function, but it's still a relatively um, simple, uh, at least from the linear algebra point of view, uh, a natural uh, expression uh, to play with. Um, and then, once again, there are convergence theorems that say that, that if, if, uh, if, if you know that, that, uh, that these log potentials converge in an appropriate sense, maybe in probability or almost surely or whatever, uh, and, 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 and uh, this Z is a parameter. So um, you may ask, for almost every Z, you have convergence almost surely, for instance. 
Um, there's, there's various flavors of convergence. Um, again, I don't want to dwell on, on, this, on the details. They are somewhat important, but uh, not the most uh, um, challenging portion of the theory. Again, there are theorems that tell you that, that, that if you have um, convergence of log potentials and maybe some, um, uh, some tightness bounds, uh, um, you need to stop the measures from running off to infinity. Um, so you need some control on the measures in addition to this. Um, but those are usually available. Um, yeah, plus maybe some other technical conditions, then you can hope that you can conclude that these measures converge to the limit measure that you want. OK, so these are the three basic methods that we have um, for um, Well, OK, there's, there are more, but, but these are the three that, that I'll talk about. Now, um, the moment method and the structure transfer method work quite well for um, for emission matrices, uh, although as Larcher pointed out, um, Mohn method is particularly good for understanding the edge of the spectrum, not so good in the bulk. Uh, but the structure transform is good for understanding the edge and the bulk. Um, with, so uh, uh, let's see, where should I start? Um, okay, so I'm going to start with the moment method. So the um, the reason, well, okay, so there's a couple of things. Okay, so it, in in um, so why doesn't the moment method work in the complex case? So there's, 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 I can give you two explanations. Um, one is that um, this convergence theorem, I stated here, uh, convergence theorems of this type are generally true in the real line and false in the complex numbers. See, um, on, on the real line, once you have convergence of every moment, then you have convergence, um, then, then you can replace the, the moment by any polynomial. And of course, you, you, get, you get the same by linearity, you get the same sort of convergence. And uh, on the real line, or at least on any compact subset of the real line, the polynomials are dense okay, by the wise fast approximation theorem. And so once, once you, you have convergence of polynomials, you get convergence of all test functions, uh, assuming, let's say, that uh, you have some uniform compact support um, on, on all these measures. Um, and then uh, and that gives you vague convergence. Okay, so um, moment convergence theorems are available on the reals. Um, but on, on the complex numbers, um, they're not available. The, the complex polynomials are not dense uh, in the space of all continuous functions. The wise approximation theorem is not true in the complex domain. Um, and the abstraction is Cauchy's theorem. Okay? When you integrate a polynomial or any holomorphic function on a closed contour, you get zero. But you integrate a non-holomorphic function, even, even if it's smooth, you, get, you usually get non-zero. And so you cannot approximate, you know, for example, z-bar is a good example of a complex smooth function which is not approximated by, by polynomials. Um, and so um, the moments only give you part of the information you need to understand the measure. Um, so you know, just to give you one example, you know, if you take the circular measure, okay, it's going to be in a circle. If you take all, this, all the mass of, of the um, circle and you compress it to a point, and, and you just take the Dirac mass of the origin, these guys have the same moments. Okay, if you integrate uh, zk against the circle measure, you can just check that, you, that you, that's the same as just integrating against the, the Dirac mass. Okay, so if k is 0, both sides are 1. And if k is positive, uh, both sides are 0. Um, it's because of the, uh, the circular symmetry uh, of, of the circular law. They're both circular. In fact, in fact any um, measure which is rotationally symmetric will have, will have the same moments. Uh, the, the, yes? If you, if you took polynomials in the bar as well. Yes. That would fix things, yes. OK, so, so if you knew. Okay, so if you yeah, so if you uh, if you had uh, could control mixed moments of z and, and z bar, then um, uh, and if, if these all converge to the right thing, that would give you um, yes. Then the wise approximation approximation would work, assuming uh, your measures have compact support or something, um, and, and and you'd be done. But the uh, the problem is that these statistics yeah, so there is no easy formula like this that relates these mixed moments to some nice simple uh, expression of the. Um, of, of, it, it's, it's not just taking m into the k and m star into the l. Okay, the matrices are not normal, um, and so uh, yeah, the, 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 there is no good. Yeah, these are about as hard to understand as the entire spectral measure. Um, so we haven't got any mileage. We, we you know, so that, there's a natural approach, but we, we um, yeah, but you're stuck at the first step. Um, okay. Uh, yes, uh, but yeah. So that that's that's one way to see why the moment method is insufficient to to uh, to tackle this problem. Um, another reason why the moment method can't work, a different obstruction. Uh, so I'll just say in words first and then explain what I mean with this, is, is that uh, moments are stable and spectra of 
Also noch ein bisschen mit dieser Anstebung. Okay, so what I mean by this is that if you take your matrix, you know, this, this ID matrix, and you, and you just change it a little bit, like maybe you change, you change one entry. Um, you just change one entry, you know, flip, flip a plus one to a minus one. Um, that barely changes these moments. These moments uh, barely, they're, they're not sensitive to, to tiny changes in, in a single variable. They're, they're, they're polynomials of, of all the coefficients, and most of the terms don't involve the one coefficient you're tweaking. So these moments are, are very um, stable. Uh, you, you, you change the matrix a little bit, uh, nothing much happens. Um, and in the Hermitian case, um, eigenvalues are stable in the Hermitian case. This is maybe I, sh I should emphasize the yes, spectra of Hermitian matrices. Are stable. So if you have a Hermitian matrix, okay, and you add, a, you, you add a small error to it, you, 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 you say you change one entry. I guess you have to change two entries because it's Hermitian. Um, then the, the eigenvalues of this matrix are very close to the eigenvalues of, of, of the first matrix. So all these inequalities that relate them. For example, the, the valid inequalities, um, for example, the, the, the jth eigenvalue of, of this Hermitian matrix, if these are both Hermitian, um, differs from the eigenvalue of the same eigenvalue of, of the original matrix, bounded by, for example, the operator norm. Okay, this, this is an, an easy inequality um, that, that, that you can prove. Um, and there are many, many other inequalities like this. Okay, that's a whole story in itself, by the way, but okay. Um, yeah, that, uh, um, yeah so that if you change things a little bit, the eigenvalues uh, don't change very much. Okay, so this is true for each j. There's this variance where you sum in j, you sum the, the, the violent Hoff Hoffman inequality is very useful, and so on and so forth. Okay, um, nothing like this is true in the non hermitian case. Um, in the non hermitian case, the eigenvalues are, well, first of all, lambda g doesn't even make sense because the eigenvalues are not ordered. Um, so that's already um, a problem. Um, but even if you somehow ignore that problem, um, the eigenvalues are still technically continuous. You know, that for every epsilon there's a delta, such that if you change the matrix by an epsilon, the, uh, the, the by a, uh, which way does it go? Uh, by a delta, the, uh, the eigenvalues only change by an epsilon. Um, but, um, uh, but the dependence of epsilon and delta is very, very bad. Um, so, you know, from the point of view of estimates, which is what we care about, it's, 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 as, if they, that they were, it's, it's as if they weren't continuous at all. So at this point, we get the standard example, which everybody gives. Um, so suppose you consider the right shift operator. Okay. One's on the upper diagonal, and zero is everywhere else. Okay? So this matrix is no potent. If you raise it to the nth power, you get zero. Okay? The, 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 the diagonal just keeps shifting over and over to the right. And uh, uh, after a while, you, you get nothing. Um, so this matrix is no potent, so all the eigenvalues are zero. So the, the spectral law of this matrix is just the Dirac mass of the origin. Okay, there's, there's just one big cluster of eigenvalues at zero, no eigenvalues anywhere else. Okay, so that's what the spectral law looks like. Okay, but now if you just perturb it, and I'll just perturb it in one entry, the bottom entry, and just by, by a very small amount, by an exponentially small quantity, two to the minus n. Okay, so I take the same matrix, I just I change one entry, by an exponentially small amount, what happens to, to the matrix? Well, if, it's no longer important. If you compute the nth power, um, now that um, uh, uh, sort of the, the, the adjacency matrix, or the, the, the graph is, is now, now has a big so, uh, cycle, and what you get is 2 to the minus n, 2 to the minus n, 2 to the minus n. You get a diagonal matrix. So it is now uh, 2 to the minus n. Uh, and so, in fact, the eigenvalues you can compute, the eigenvalues of this matrix are the nth roots of 2 to the minus n. So it's, it's 1 half times all the roots of unity. Um, another way of seeing it is that uh, the characteristic polynomial of, of this matrix is just z to the n, and the characteristic polynomial of this matrix is z to the n minus 2 to the minus n, uh, plus or minus, probably minus. Um, okay. Um, all right. And so these eigenvalues are. are are, um, are spread out uniformly on the circle of radius one half. Okay, so you have a matrix whose spectrum is, is all stuck at zero, and then you, you take this exponentially small change, and suddenly all the eigenvalues repel each other very fast and have moved a constant distance away from the other, uh, from where they were, and are now, now stuck, uh, spread out somewhere else. Okay, so um, so there's a dr dramatic change between between uh, these two empirical spectral measures, even though the matrix changed very little. 
And because moments are stable, the, the moment method doesn't see this. Um, if you look at these two measures, um, in fact, all moments up to the n minus first order are the same. Okay? The, 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 the mass of the origin and, 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 uh, and, and this distribution, they, they have exactly the same moments, first, second, third, fourth, all the way up to n minus one. That's actually, well, that's Fourier analysis, okay, but um, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's precisely the Fourier inversion formula, actually. It's only the nth moment that differs. Um, so the, uh, yeah, so, so, so these, these um, two measures are almost indistinguishable from each other from, by the moment method, because the moment method is stable. It, it can't see this perturbation. But the spectrum here is unstable. So um, it, it, uh, yeah, small perturbations become important, um, which is a real headache for many reasons. Um, so for example, in, in the Wigner case, um, there's this issue of tails. Right? So sometimes you, you, you don't have uh, bounded entries. Sometimes the entries have, can occasionally be large. But, but often you can truncate um, your matrix, you throw away the large entries, and because of all this stability type theorems, you can show that, that the, very, the, the outliers, the very large um, measures, as, as long as you're not really heavy tail, so as long as, say, the second moment still stays finite, um, you can show that the, uh, the, the, the effect of the really uh, large values are not very important, and you can truncate and you can restrict to the, without loss to another, assuming that all your entries are bounded. Um, and because of the instability, you can't automatically do that in the um, um, non emission case. So, so the case of, slow, of, of heavy tailed matrices is significantly more delicate than, um, than, um, than say, bounded entry. Um, you can't just immediately restrict the, to reduce the bounded case, which you often can in, in the emission case. OK, so that's the moment, moment method. Um, so let's go on to the storage transfer method. Now, this is a bit better. Um, it's better because the storage transfer was worse. Um, uh, worse in the sense that it is less stable with respect to, to perturbations in, 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 in uh, the matrix, which sounds bad, but you, but you have to use a method which is unstable with respect to the, the matrix if you have kind of any chance to prove the circular law. Um, yeah, so the, um, um, so this, uh, this trace, if you, if you change m by a little bit, um, you, um, uh, this um, resolvent can change quite a bit, particularly if, um, if Z is, uh, for example, if, if, if Z is very close to the spectrum of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of M, then, then, uh, uh, then it's very unstable. Okay. But the thing is, you, you get to choose what Z is. Z can wander all around the complex plane. Um, and as a general rule of thumb, if Z is very far away from the spectrum of your matrix, then um, then things are more stable and, and you have a better understanding of, 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 of this quantity. It's, it's when, you, when you push the spectrum, or more generally something called pseudo spectrum, which maybe we'll talk about in a little bit, um, then, uh, then this becomes unstable again. Now, in the, um, in the Wigner case, this is a very good tool to use um, because in the Hermitian case, in the Hermitian case, the spectrum is real. It lies in real lines. So, so typically, it's concentrated on some interval. Okay, for example, minus two to two is very typical. Okay, so if you have a Wigner matrix, the spectrum is over here. But Z, you can pick anywhere. Um, and the further the Z away is from the spectrum, um, the more control we have on, on, on the, the sort of transform. So, so basically, the, uh, the key parameter, which you saw a lot in, uh, in Erdős's lectures, actually, is, is, the, um, is the imaginary part of the spectral parameter Z, okay? Something called eta. 